We as Christadelphians believe that the whole Bible is written by God. The Bible, which many of you have in front of you, is no ordinary book, but is rather God's divine message to his creation. And it's from this understanding that we seek to learn what we can about God, his plan and his purpose. And the Bible tells us that this is clearly the case. It's in Paul's second letter to Timothy that we read, no need to turn there. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means it was breathed out by God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, correct, uh, for, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible therefore tells us that we need to use it to instruct us on how we should live our lives. And we believe that God used the prophets to be the vehicle for this message. It was not the words, their words that they spoke, but it was God's words that were put into their mouths. And these prophets, often risking their very lives, brought God's message to his creation. And now we can safely read about these things recorded for us in the Bible. It says in Second Peter chapter 1, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In fact, scripture records for us that the prophet Jeremiah, the word of God was in the prophet's heart like a burning fire. So the Christadelphians, we believe every word recorded in the Holy Scriptures to be from God and therefore of utmost importance. And we aim to understand its message by carefully reading. So the aim tonight, tonight, this evening, is to make clear what the Bible says to us about the first man, Adam. And we'll see that what science preaches doesn't actually corroborate with what the Bible says. So as an overview, I simply just want to answer three questions this evening. Who is Adam and where did he come from? That's kind of two, but we'll call it one question. Who is Adam and where did he come from? Number two, why do we die? And number three, practically, how can we live forever? So who is Adam and where did he come from? Well, many of our thoughts, whenever we look at scripture, actually originate in Genesis. And this is no surprise this evening that this is the case as well. So if your Bibles are open, Genesis chapter one, please, because we're told in Genesis chapter one that God created everything that we see around us. So just have a look. Genesis chapter one and verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when and how did God create man? Well, we have to just come down a little bit further into the chapter to verse 27, which is the sixth day of creation, where we read these words. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So God, amongst many other things that he created, he created mankind. But mankind wasn't like many of the men and women that we see around us today. Just come to the end of the chapter. So verse 31, we read here. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God said that everything he created was very good. It was amazing. Yet we must only look in the world that we see around us to see the wickedness of man. Mankind isn't very good. We see in the news regularly about robberies, murders, and other wicked acts that take place on this planet. Many of you will be aware that the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and often going back and seeing the words that God chose in the original language aims to give us a better understanding of what God is telling us. Now, this word for God that we have in our Bibles here is more interesting than you might think. The word God in Hebrew, this, this word is the word Elohim. It's unsurprisingly comes from comes thousands of times in the Bible. God is revealed to us with a name. That name is when we see it in capital L-O-R-D, the name Yahweh. And that's revealed in Exodus chapter three, but not our subject today. But also shows that he has many different titles. And Elohim is one of those titles. And it really means mighty ones. It's plural. And so when we read verse 27 again with this understanding at the towards the end of the chapter, 
And this might help us to make a bit more sense of what's being said. So verse 27 of Genesis 1. So the mighty ones created man in his own image. In the image of the mighty ones created he him. Male and female created he them. You see, God uses his angels, his ministering spirits, we read elsewhere in in the Bible, to do his work. So how awesome is this, that God created us by his angels, and we are in the image of those angels. Notice also here the Bible's claim, he created them male and female. It's, It's really simple. We see, don't we, in these recent times, a rising concept where there are more than two genders. But the Bible is simple. He created male and female. So move on now to chapter two, please. We have a bit more detail in how man was created. So chapter two, I'm going to read verse seven. And the Lord, this is the name of God that we were just talking about, Yahweh. The Lord... God, Elohim, so Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So this is how God created a man. His angels first first took the dust of the ground, made them into the image of the angels, and then breathed into the man, into the man's nostrils, the breath of life. Later in Genesis, we read of a man called Abraham. He knew this fact. These are the words that he spoke in Genesis 18. He said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. So Abraham, the father of the Jews, he knew that he was just dust and ashes as well. And we could go to many other examples where this is kind of reaffirmed as a Bible principle coming through. But there was a man called Job that we read about far later. And several times through the 42 chapters of Job, we read a recognition of this fact. Just one example, no need to turn there, is in Job 33, where he says, I also am formed out of the clay. We will see as we go on through that the living... Sorry, bear with me. So yes, we'll see as we go on through this evening that the living soul described in Job and in a number of other places isn't what we might understand as being what the uh, what the churches preach of this idea of an immortal soul. In fact, the idea of an immortal soul doesn't even appear in our Bibles. This false teaching was did, adopted in early centuries after Jesus has walked the earth. And it came possibly from Greek ideology on the afterlife. These things are uh, adopted in religions like Hinduism, for example. But we have clear words recorded for us in places like the prophecy of Ezekiel, which is somewhere in the middle of our Bibles. And again, I don't want you to turn there, but it says there, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Here we can conclude that the Bible teaches something quite opposite to an immortal soul, but that a soul that sins, it will die. And now a sin is just defined as missing the mark. It's where God gives us a commandment and we miss, we sin. And it's an important concept that we'll come on to when we look at our second question shortly. Now, again, this word soul is the Hebrew word nephesh. And it simply means a breathing creature. That is what God here created, a creature he called man. So if you're in Genesis 2 still, we'll just read verse 18. So verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And we read later, of course, that he created a woman. So it says, I will make him and help meet for him, literally someone to help man. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. 
And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Just in passing, here the name Adam is actually first used in all of the Bible. Adam was the first man. That was his name. And we go on to read then in verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So God saw the problem straight away. We humans, we're social creatures. We need to have other like-minded people around us. And God gave Adam this privilege of naming every single creature that he had created. But there was no helper for Adam, no companion for Adam. And therefore God brought a woman, not described as being from the dust of the earth this time, but being constructed from Adam himself. This, this woman, later called Eve, came from Adam. And again, this is an important Bible theme picked up later in our Bibles. But to summarise our first question, who is Adam and where did he come from? Well, Adam was a man. He was created from the dust of the earth by God using his angels. God created Adam on the sixth day with all of the other land and air creatures. And when he had formed him from the dust of the earth into a shape and image of the angels, he breathed into him God's power. He was given life. But most importantly, God tells us that everything he created, when it was first created, was very good. So our second question, why do we die? Well, let's just establish why we're even talking about death. We read it in our introductory reading. Just look again at chapter 2 and um, verse 17. It says there, doesn't it? The law that was given to Adam. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. <coughs> so here we read that God had one rule, a law. Adam was not allowed to eat of this tree. We read earlier in this chapter that Adam could have eaten of any other trees in the garden. But he was placed under this one law, not to eat of the tree of good and evil. The consequence, God said, was simple, that if he disobeyed God and if he ate of that, the fruit of that tree, then he would die. And this is a really important teaching introduced all the way back here in Genesis. That is the disobedience brings about death. But therefore, the reverse is also true, that obedience, the con sorry, that the continuation of life is contingent upon people obeying. If we want life after death, then we must obey God. Now, we know that from the reading that we've just considered that Adam, sadly, Adam did eat of the fruit of which God had commanded him not to. The serpent, as we read, persuaded Eve to eat of the fruit that she and then she gave it to her husband Adam who did eat uh, Genesis 3 verse 1 it reads now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made and he said unto the woman yea hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden now this serpent we don't know exactly what creature it was. It was evidently different from what we would understand a serpent to be today. Here able to speak to the woman, to, to demonstrate an instinctive thought process. And Eve was subsequently deceived. Verse 6, as we've read, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. <coughs> so crucially, Adam, to whom God's commandment was given, disobeyed God. 
And fundamentally, disobeying God is sinning. We read in places like 1 John uh, chapter 3, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Adam sinned. He literally, he missed the mark. God later challenges him in the chapter, and his response is in verse 12. So chapter 3, verse 12. <clears throat> and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. There was this blame that was passed from Adam to Eve and eventually on to the serpent. And we can often find this to be true, can't we? It is our nature to want to justify our own actions, to blame others, to make us seem better. But here there was no excuse. And we read on of these three verdicts that God gives, firstly to the serpent, secondly to Eve, and finally to Adam. So firstly, the serpent. Well, verse 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now this verse would seem to explain why we don't see talking serpents today. Instead, because of this deceitful act, the serpent is punished with a life of crawling on its belly, what perhaps we would recognise to be a snake. But also, in these verses, there's this critical prophecy for us to understand. We read, didn't we, verse 15, that God would put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between the serpent's seed and between the woman's seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou, the serpent, shalt bruise the seed of the woman's heel. Now, as we've already said, we've made the point that every word in scripture is inspired. It's chosen by God. We read here of this bruising being delivered to the head of the serpent, a fatal blow compared to the serpent's bruising of the heel of mankind, this painful but less serious wound. Now, we understand when we put scriptures together that Christ is that seed of the woman. We read genealogies that show Jesus was descended all the way from Eve. It was Jesus, we understand, to be the seed of the woman, described in verse 15. And sin, we understand, to be of the seed of the serpent, the serpent in 2 Corinthians is equated with the corruption of the mind. And in Revelation, we read it's cast out because it deceived the world. It is a symbol of sin itself. So from Genesis 3.15, we see this prophecy that a curse came upon all mankind, that sin would be this continual bruising on the heel of mankind, even men like Jesus Christ. And we personally, we feel the effects of this bruising every day. We all have the ability to sin and we do sin. However, Christ, despite having that ability to sin, that seed of the woman was equally able to sin, but, as the, but he didn't. But the seed, Christ as the seed of the woman, that uh, converse side of the prophecy would deal this fatal blow to the head of the serpent. And in verse 16, we then have the second of these verdicts, this time to the woman, to Eve. So verse 16, unto the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So because Eve deceived her husband, she would be subject to him. He would rule over her. And she would be given the painful responsibility of bearing children. But then the final verdict comes in verse 17. So chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam God said, 
because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shalt it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. This is, of course, speaking of death. We saw how the Elohim made Adam of the dust of the earth, and here, because of Adam's sin, he would return to the dust of the earth. Adam would die. Being then banished from the garden, he would also suffer the hardships of finding food for himself in working on the land. But most critically, because of Adam's disobedience, death came upon all men. We read about this actually in our New Testament multiple times. But one example that I'd like you to now turn to is in Romans, please. So Romans in chapter 5. In our New Testaments, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts and then Romans. So Romans chapter 5. Verse 12, it reads here, Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So why do we die? Our second question. Well, we die because we are descended from Adam. Because of his sin that we've seen in the Garden of Eden, Because he broke that law, death passed upon all men. In the Psalms, we read this. Psalm 51 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Adam was sentenced to return to the ground from which he was taken, as God said that he would, a sentence which we also have inherited. We die as a direct consequence of sin. We all bear this curse from birth, as the psalmist said in that passage, and therefore we all die. But our last question provides hope. How can we live forever? Well, if you're still in Romans, just come over the page to chapter six, please, because there is something that we can do. Because in the context of all that we've been reading, we get to verse 12 of chapter six. Chapter 6 of Romans and verse 12 reads, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. The only way we can live forever starts with us listening to God and not allowing our disobedience to God to rule in our lives. And we pick up the record again in verse 21, please, of Romans 6. We read there, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I.e., what that's saying, what benefit, what fruit do you have in the wickedness of this world? The answer, of course, is nothing. The wickedness of this world will all perish. But now, continuing on, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we read here of those two choices, either the fruit of the world, which leads to death or the fruit of holiness, sin leading to death or eternal life in Jesus. Just notice the language we considered in verse 23, the wages of sin. It's deliberate. It's a deliberate choice of words here, describing how that we are bound by sin. We're stuck into this cycle of paying to sin. Yet we need this gift, this gift from God to exit this cycle. 1 Corinthians 15 says, For as in Adam all die, 
even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And it is important to note that this isn't easy. Every one of us in the room, I'm sure, struggles with this every single day. Romans was penned by the Apostle Paul through inspiration, that breathing out of God's words. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul is inspired to express his frustrations at the struggle of fighting sin. So Romans 7, please. And I'm just going to read from verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And he's describing this continual war in the mind of those who try to obey God. We try to do good, but we do it not. We try not to do evil, but the evil that we try not to do, that's what we do. And it leaves Paul to exclaim in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And indeed, there is one who can deliver from this body of death. The one who we've already seen is the gift of God through in Romans 6 verse 23. The one who in Genesis 3 verse 15, the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, who could destroy sin. John chapter 1 uses these words to describe Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So God, in his kindness, has a plan of restoration. He always had this plan, whereby we might be brought back to God, brought back to being very good once more, where the sins of this world may be removed. And this plan ultimately gives us an opportunity for you and for me to be rescued from this cycle of sin and death. To quote Revelation, a time when God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And it's in its simplest form we have this plan that God made revealed to us in the Gospel of John. These words I'm sure will be familiar to many. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So if all that we've considered this evening is true, then what does God require us to do? Well, it's in the Gospel of Mark that we read these words. Mark chapter 16 it's Jesus here speaking to his disciples. And Jesus said unto his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the good news, the gospel, to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We see, therefore, the Bible teaches us that we need to do these two things. We Number one, we need to believe. We need to know what God has said. And fight that battle of sin every day. And we need to be baptised. And that's the complete immersion in water. The washing away of our sins. Taught elsewhere in scripture. But I'm not going to go into it for the purposes of this evening. But as we start to bring our thoughts to a close. Turn with me to the first of Corinthians in chapter 15 please. In first Corinthians chapter 15 speaks here of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So chapter 15, let's go in at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, since by Adam came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. By Adam came death, for as in Adam all die. 
However, by Christ, the resurrection of the dead was made possible. And all those in Christ, as it says, that means all those who are baptized into the name of Christ, those in Christ who die will not remain dead. And the Bible goes on to explain that Jesus Christ will return to the earth and he will judge the world to see whether men believe and have been baptized into Christ. This is part of God's plan. The last passage I'm just going to quote to you now this evening is taken from the Gospel of Luke. And it's chapter nine. It says there, if any man will come after me, these are the words of Jesus. If any man will follow after Jesus, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. God gave his only begotten son that through his sacrifice, we might have this gift of God, eternal life. We must make this conscious decision to believe, to follow Christ. That means living a life of sacrifice, not a literal crucifixion, but a continual denying of our own wants and desires, battling against sin. So to summarize the answer to our last question, God is calling us. His hand is stretched out toward us. Do we believe the things that we've considered this evening? Do we believe the Bible? If so, then we must be baptised to sacrifice our own desires for God's sake. And we can then, by God's grace, enter into it, his eternal kingdom upon this earth when Jesus returns. And what a wonderful place the kingdom of God will be. A place where everyone dwells together safely, truly at peace. No sin and no death will be there, for Christ will have destroyed death itself and all will be to the glory of God.